The Laughing Cavalier here, presenting to you another tale of these troubled times. Today, we shall be breaking down the trailer for the upcoming 2023 movie, Napoleon. Beyond that, we will also be looking at some of the behind the scenes, since I was hoping to do a video on that as well. But I have decided to collapse the information I had for that into this, so be prepared for a slightly longer trailer breakdown than usual. I will also be including pictures published in a variety of newspapers, and taken from members of the public, who I have tried to credit where possible. As always, sources are in the description. I will admit right here and now, I'm a little... saddened by what I've seen thus far, from behind the scenes, and the trailer has confirmed a few of my suspicions. So, compared to other reviews out there at the moment, don't expect glowing wall-to-wall -wall praise from me. Firstly though, let us look at the background behind the production. In 2020, Ridley Scott, who has directed a few films in his time, announced that his next project would be a biographical film retelling the life of Napoleon Bonaparte, the famous general and French emperor, with the script being written by David Scarper. Initially called Kitbag, this name was later dropped in favour of just calling it Napoleon. News of casting was a bit limited at first, with only the two starring leads being announced, that being Joaquin Phoenix as Napoleon and Jodie Comer as Josephine. Filming was due to start in 2021, but was pushed back due to the, um, god damn it, I'm sick of mentioning it. Anyway, due to the delayed filming, Jodie Comer was forced to pull out of her role due to another project that she was already committed to, namely her debut on the stage. This meant that Vanessa Kirby was cast as Josephine in her place. Other than that, and a few brief cast announcements a bit later, and the date of the film's release, November 2023, there was not much in the way of news regarding the production. Thankfully, due to the press and various local sleuths, we've been able to piece together a good idea of when and where filming took place, what scenes were probably filmed, and even some extra bits of casting, which is what shall be dotted throughout the breakdown of the trailer, which was released on the 10th of July 2023. Before we begin looking at the trailer itself, as usual, I must state that I won't be using many clips from the actual video itself due to copyright concerns, and instead will post screenshots with timestamps in the top left, with a link to the trailer in the description below. And with that, on to the trailer. It begins! In this first part, we are informed that it is France, 1793, and see a woman with long white hair being led to the guillotine, as an angry mob pelts her with vegetables and bays for her blood. The trailer doesn't state so, but one source who viewed the movie at a prior screening claimed that Marie Antoinette's execution is a part of the movie, and the IMDb lists Irish actress Catherine Walker as playing the role, so it is most likely her. It should be noted that the actress is about a decade older than the Queen was at her death, although the white hair is technically accurate due to the severe stress Marie had suffered for obvious reasons. However, she would have had her hair cropped short for the blade of the guillotine, which is something that must have been known about by the filmmakers since, later on in the trailer, we see Josephine looking like this. Which is accurate, by the way, since having short hair like those condemned to the guillotine was a style for a while after the terror ended. So I tied an onion to my belt, which was the style at the time. This scene was one of the earlier ones filmed and was done outside Somerset House in London around about March of 2022. It is possible there will be other scenes showing the reign of terror in general, since in some behind the scenes pictures from what looked like rehearsals, we can see other people being led to the guillotine, and even a group of nuns, possibly the Carmelite nuns who were all executed as a group towards the end of the terror, waiting near the scaffold. Napoleon in the clip is being addressed by the revolutionary politician Paul Barat, played by Tahar Rahim, who says to him, no doubt you have seen the chaos in the streets. And then in a different clip, Napoleon is told that we must make an example or France will fall, which I assume is the execution being depicted on screen, but could also just be the terror in general. Another minor nitpick, but for some reason, it looks like the guillotine is missing the bascule that the victim will be strapped onto before being slid under the blade. Instead, 
It looks like they just kneel down, which seems like a bit of an odd thing to miss, since the design of the guillotine has usually been gotten right in most historical productions in the past. Although, perhaps they could have made a cut to the budget. No pun intended. It does also appear that Napoleon will be doing a bit of teleporting in this film, since in October of 1793, when Marie Antoinette was executed, Napoleon was a bit busy fighting at the Siege of Toulon, which is something we will soon see. Napoleon is asked by Barat, in a scene happening a bit later in the movie, as shall soon be made apparent, what would you do if this assignment of defence was assigned to you? Followed by a montage of Napoleon commanding an artillery battery to fire upon a large crowd in the streets. This assignment of defence is depicted in the events of the 13th of Vendemiaire, 1795, and was filmed about the same time as the guillotine scenes, with the location for these parts being done at the old Royal Naval College at Greenwich. The 13th of Vendemiaire was one of the most pivotal events in Napoleon's early years. Following the downfall of Robespierre and the execution of those responsible for the Reign of Terror, the Republic was governed by a body known as the Directory, which was not particularly popular, despite possibly because of the mass executions of royalist sympathisers, a movement formed with the intention of overthrowing the Republic and restoring the monarchy. And on the 13th of Vendemiaire, the 5th of October, 1795, about 30,000 supporters of the coup marched through the streets of Paris. In the trailer, as well as behind the scenes, we can see many extras waving flags with the fleur-de-lis, and in one clip chanting, Long Live the King. Now, whilst it is accurate that the supporters of the coup are virtually all in civilian gear, As far as I'm aware, we have no sources as to what standards the Royalists would have carried during the coup attempt, if any at all. Some of the flags look a little too formal, particularly the flag tops with the fleur-de-lis, and the flags in the trailer with the blue and red seem to resemble those of the Compagnie Franche de la Marine, who were troops under the command of the French Navy that famously served in North America during the Seven Years' War, slash French and Indian War, being disbanded in 1761. If I had to guess... The standards they would actually have carried may have resembled something similar to those used by the Royal and Catholic Army in the Vendée, with banners and slogans rather than much more professional-looking royal standards in blue and white. If I may also make an observation about the Republican standards throughout the trailer, they simply carry the tricolour flag of France, unadorned, without any identifying numbers, accoutrements, etc. In reality, the standards used by the Republican forces at this point in time were quite elaborate, having evolved from the old pre-revolutionary system although some National Guard units did have simpler designs. So in this instance, it is not too inaccurate. Just a shame, really, since in some later scenes in the film, certain units are carrying the correct standards. Despite being outnumbered 3-1, to one, the Republican forces were saved by the quick thinking of Napoleon, who crushed the coup with a whiff of grape shot, to not actually quote Napoleon, since he probably never said this line. As we can see in the trailer, though, he is commanding one of the batteries, and we will probably see something similar, no doubt. This sequence gives us a look at the Siege of Toulon, the battle that gave Napoleon his first major victory. These sequences were actually filmed in Malta, towards the end of principal photography in April to May of 2022, and, sadly, I do think them among the more problematic of the sequences in the trailer, for want of a better term. To briefly sum up the historical situation, Toulon was one of the primary bases of the French fleet, and, in August of 1793, the city had revolted against the government in Paris, requesting help from the Allies. Soon, British, Spanish, and various Italian troops and ships had arrived to secure the port, which would be a serious blow to French naval power in the Mediterranean, if the city were to remain in royalist hands. And so, a ramshackle revolutionary force was assembled to take back the city. Napoleon, at this point a young artillery captain, found himself in command of the artillery, and it was through his planning and organisation that the city would eventually fall in December. One of the most critical parts of the siege was the taking of the British-held redoubt at Fort Mulgrave, nicknamed Little Gibraltar. Once it fell, Napoleon was able to fire his artillery directly into the Allied fleet in the harbour, as seen here in the trailer. My main problem, though, is that they have rather exaggerated the fort in its scale. Scott used Fort Ricasoli in Malta, a rather old stone fort, whereas Mulgrave was an earthen redoubt, dug by the British. In other parts of the film, they have dug trenches in other scenes that would have been somewhat similar to Mulgrave. I feel like they are exaggerating the size of the fort to make its capture seem more impressive, although Napoleon leading the final attack and being wounded is perfectly accurate. What concerns me more, though, is something that has been bugging me ever since the casting was announced. Napoleon's age. We are so old. Joaquin Phoenix was about 47 when filming all these scenes in early 2022. Remember though, 
Napoleon was 24 at the Siege of Toulon, and his energetic leadership was one of the qualities that inspired his men. Hell, even though he was 45 at Waterloo, he still looked a lot younger than the Phoenix does. When I look at him, no offence, but I get the impression of lethargic apathy. Smithers, who is this barrel-chested go-getter? Yes, he may be a decent actor, but the bits from this trailer make him seem a bit too mellow and subdued. The way he talks is far too quiet, and not very engaging from what I've seen so far in this trailer. I promise you brilliant successes. This is my uniform. I'm destined for greatness. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> Although, obviously, we won't know until the full movie comes out. Still, I believe they really should have gotten a much younger actor, at the very least for the early years. And, I will get onto this later, but they should probably split the movie into two parts. Anyway, we have more to cover, although still on the age front, and that is the character of Josephine, played by Vanessa Kirby. If Phoenix is too old for the role, then the opposite is true of Kirby. Josephine de Bernay was already a widow when she met Napoleon, her first husband having been guillotined in the terror, and Josephine herself only narrowly escaping the same fate. Napoleon famously became infatuated with her, one only has to read a few of his love letters to see his absolute devotion, and they were married in 1796, although the marriage was a rather troubled and unusual one to say the least, with both parties having more affairs than, insert clever pun about modern politician of choice here. One of the most notable things about Josephine, though, was that she was six years older than Napoleon. Meanwhile, Vanessa Kirby was about 33-34 when acting in this. Technically not inaccurate for the early revolutionary years, but it is very jarring compared to the much older Napoleon here, and since we are going up to the imperial period, when Josephine was well into her 40s, I don't think the much more youthful looking Kirby can really show us this aspect of their relationship. It was her age, after all, that eventually made Napoleon divorce her when he wanted to start a dynasty, although the two still remained close friends until Josephine's death in 1814. Moving on, we get a bit of an odd segment, which is meant to depict the Battle of the Pyramids during Napoleon's Egyptian campaign. For some reason, we have the French troops firing at the top of the pyramids themselves, which... How the hell are the guns even hitting them? Cannons like this, even with a slight angle, would not be able to hit that high up. You'd want a howitzer or something to reach there. I hope this isn't going to be the movie making out that Napoleon is going to destroy the pyramids and crush the Mameluk army under them or something over the top like that. We do get a nice shot when Napoleon looks at the Great Sphinx of Giza, modelled on the iconic 1880s painting. Other than this, I doubt we'll get much more of Napoleon's Egyptian and Syrian campaigns, since Scott has already said there would only be six major battle scenes, and they you can quickly squeeze in the Siege of Acre and the Battle of Abukir Bay, which effectively ended Bonaparte's Middle Eastern plans. It is not explicitly stated in the trailer, but these scenes of Napoleon charging on horseback into lines of what appeared to be white-clad Austrian troops appears to be the Battle of Morango. This battle occurred on the 14th of June 1800, when Napoleon, now the first consul and leader of the French Republic, led his forces to victory against the Austrians, in a battle that further secured his position, following his coup the previous year, which we will look at later in the trailer. Interesting fact, the film was actually codenamed Marengo during filming. The battle is famous for how it initially looked like the Austrians were on the verge of a great victory, until French reinforcements arrived and completely changed the course of the fighting. We cannot really see the Austrians here, although I can just make out they are wearing bearskins which is accurate for the Grenadiers, whilst the line troops at this point wore helmets, like those on the screen here. Not much else to comment on other than, again, it does appear they might be exaggerating Napoleon here by showing him personally leading a massed cavalry charge. Of course, that is not to say he didn't fight on the front lines. Even at Waterloo, right at the end of his career, he had to be convinced not to go forward with the Imperial Guard, but in this particular battle, as far as I'm aware, he wasn't, instead coordinating the troops and I suspect that they might be doing this as a moment where everyone will go, oh my, look, he's personally changing the course of this battle. In this brief clip, we get some shots of the Hundred Days, namely Grenoble. In 1814, Napoleon was finally defeated by the coalition, who exiled him to the Italian island of Elba, with a small guard of about a thousand men. Meanwhile, they restored the Bourbon dynasty under King Louis XVIII, the brother of the guillotined Louis XVI. In 1815, Napoleon escaped with his thousand men and landed in the south of France, intending to overthrow the Bourbons and restore his empire. Although, if this promotional picture is anything to go by, he will be accompanied by a ragged-looking standard-bearer, a Polish Ulan without a horse, 
and Gaston back here leading a few peasants. When Napoleon returned to France, King Louis XVIII sent numerous troops, including the 5th Regiment of the Line, to arrest Napoleon, and on the 7th of March, they opposed him at Grenoble. However, Napoleon famously walked towards the men, saying that, If you wish to kill your emperor, here I am. At which point the whole regiment, tired of the Bourbons, switched sides and joined him on his march to Paris, where, on the 20th, he entered the city and was briefly restored to the throne. We can see here the men are wearing the post-1812 Barden tunics, which don't show up again in this trailer, so I will go into them a bit now. From the Revolutionary period, right up until 1812, the tunics worn by the French army did not change too dramatically, being based on a style that had been more or less used since the 1770s, minus the obvious change from white to blue when the revolution happened. However, in the run-up to the Russian campaign in 1812, it was decided to adopt a new, more simpler tunic that had shorter coattails and the rectangular look replacing the old lapels, which is called the Bardin, named after the colonel who recommended to the emperor that the military should not follow the whims of civilian fashion. This new tunic was worn by most infantry and artillery regiments from then until the end of the war, the only major exception being the Imperial Guard, who retained their old tunics, as we shall look at later. The uniforms here look pretty much spot on, and I cannot see any major errors. When Napoleon ruled France, the Shakers had a plate with the Imperial Eagle and the red, white and blue cockade. When Napoleon was defeated in 1814, and the Bourbons restored, these symbols were replaced with the fleur-de-lis and white cockade of the Bourbon dynasty, and are what the men would have been wearing when they attempted to arrest Napoleon, so the trailer is quite correct showing them here. The only error is the lack of pom-poms on the fusiliers. French battalions consisted of three types of soldiers. Four companies of fusiliers, the ordinary line infantry, one company of grenadiers, with red epaulets and pom-poms, made up of the tallest and most veteran men, and the voltigeur company with yellow, whose job it was to act as skirmishers, who we can also see here. Fusilier companies, however, were distinguished by different coloured pom-poms on their shakos. Dark green for the first, sky blue for the second, orange for the third, and violet for the fourth. Productions getting rid of the pom-poms is something that sadly happens all too much. My guess would be it is the easiest thing to cut out to save money on the budget. We get a line from Talleyrand, played by Paul Rees, who suggests that Napoleon should make himself king. Talleyrand is probably the second most famous French politician behind Napoleon of this era. From initially going into the priesthood, then fully supporting the anti-clerical nature of the revolution, then transforming into a politician, he had a very eventful career, and seems to have had great survival instincts, serving the Republic, the Empire, and the Bourbon monarchy, depending on who was in power, it would seem. He was also a key player in Napoleon's rise during the events of the 18th of Brumaire. By October 1799, Napoleon had recently returned from his successful Egyptian campaign, and his popularity was high. Meanwhile, the Directory, the body effectively ruling the Republic, was an unpopular institution, due to the Austrians having inflicted a series of defeats in Napoleon's absence. Talleyrand and Lucien Bonaparte, Napoleon's younger brother, president of the Council of the 500, the equivalent of the lower chamber of the French Parliament, managed to force three of the five directors who ran the Directory to resign. The following day, the 19th of Brumaire, or the 10th of November, Napoleon stormed the building with some grenadiers, which is the scene depicted here. What actually happened after this was a bit farcical, with Napoleon being heckled and having to retreat. Lucien saved the day when he convinced the soldiers guarding the deputies that there were members of the council who were threatening the others, at which point Murat, one of Napoleon's future marshals, marched in and dispersed them, ending the directory and replacing it with the consulate, with Napoleon, of course, being the first consul, and de facto leader of the whole republic. Now, we do only get snippets here, but Napoleon coolly asking the scared-looking deputies, shall we vote, seems to imply that he will be much more calm and in control of the coup, as opposed to having Lucien support him, although Matthew Needham has been cast to play his brother, so maybe we might be getting a proper look at the coup. Costume-wise, again, a pretty good job. The Grenadiers are wearing the correct bearskins, including red plumes, the white cross here, which is actually a symbol of the Bourbons that they just didn't remove for whatever reason, and a plate with a grenade symbol on it. The only minor error here appears to be the cockade already having Imperial Eagles on them. I guess Napoleon is thinking ahead here. Meanwhile, the members of the Directory also appear to be wearing the correct outfits, this more formal attire being introduced to make them look more legitimate. Like the previous scenes of the 13th of Vendemiaire, these were filmed at the old Royal Naval College at Greenwich, so not much else to comment on here. Some shots here of Napoleon's coronation in 1804 when he transformed himself from First Consul of the Republic to Emperor of the French. 
These particular sequences were filmed at Lincoln Cathedral, standing in for Notre Dame, which, even if Ridley Scott had wanted to film there, it had a rather nasty case of burning down somewhat recently, so Lincoln is the next best thing, even if it isn't as grand. That actually might not be too inaccurate though, since when the revolution happened, the cathedral was ransacked and had certainly not recovered by the time Napoleon was crowned there. The film's version seems to have drawn inspiration from the famous painting made of the event in 1807 by Jacques-Louis David, Napoleon's official painter. The painting shows the famous moment when the Pope, who was about to place the imperial crown on Napoleon's head, had it snatched from him by the Emperor, who crowned himself. Empire magazine also released a promotional picture of Josephine being crowned by Napoleon as his consort. In the background of this shot, we can see a large group of grenadiers standing to attention, but these ones are a little different to the ones we saw earlier. On their bearskins, they have white accoutrements in place of red, and instead of just having a grenade symbol and a white cross like before, they instead have the imperial eagle, adopted by Napoleon as the main symbol of his empire, whilst the grenade symbol replaces the cross. Imperial eagles also adorn their cartridge pouches and cockades on the left side of their bearskins, whilst the tassels are white for the enlisted men, red and gold for the senior NCOs, and gold for the officers, with the more senior of these having white plumes as opposed to red for everyone else. These men are clearly meant to be the grenadiers of the Imperial Guard, Napoleon's most famous and feared troops. Before the Revolution, the kings of France had the troops of the Maison de Roi, which, by 1789, consisted of two foot guard regiments, the Gardes Francaise in dark blue, and the Gardes Suisse in dark red, whilst the Garde de Corps, also in dark blue, provided the mounted part. This is also not included in the small company-sized units such as the Gardes de la Porte, amongst others that protected various places. From 1789 to 1792, as the monarchy declined, these units would also, one by one, disappear. The Gardes Francaise were, famously, the first unit of the army to join the revolution, and were critical in the storming of the Bastille. Even though the regiment was effectively disbanded immediately afterwards, the men would go on to form the basis of the first National Guard units, whose dark blue uniforms possibly were adapted from those of the old French guards, which would then eventually become the standard for the French army. By 1791, the cavalry units had also been disbanded, the Guard de Corps in particular, after their failure to protect the Palace of Versailles during the Women's March later in 1789, leaving just the Guard Suisse. A new unit, the Constitutional Guard, was briefly raised in 1791-2 to boost the troops protecting the King, but they did not last long either, as the King disbanded them as a concession to secure more vetoes over legislation coming from the more radical Assembly, something he would soon come to regret, no doubt. Finally, in August 1792, the end of the Guard Suisse and the monarchy would come with the storming of the Tuileries Palace. Many of the guards were massacred by the mob, with some of the survivors, who did not escape, being guillotined not long after, still wearing their red uniforms. Despite the end of the Maison de Roi, the New Republic still needed some sort of guard force to protect its leaders, and this is where we see the beginnings of what would later become the Imperial Guard. Two companies were raised, one to protect the Directory and the other to guard the legislature. Unlike the previous Maison de Roi, the uniforms of these units were basically the same as the rest of the army. However, when Napoleon became consul, he had these units merged to create the Consular Guard, consisting of a battalion of infantry, all grenadiers. When Napoleon became emperor, the Consular Guard now became the Imperial Guard, and would be rapidly expanded over the coming years, until, by the end of the wars, it was practically an army within the army. Regarding the men here, they are pretty spot on, and the uniforms are the best I've seen in any production for a long time for this unit. Even better than Waterloo, I would say. The only inaccuracy with the costumes I can see is that the Imperial Guard still had the white cross on their bearskins at this point in time, the grenade symbol appearing later. Although, since we are going to a point later in time when they did have those, I think it is a forgivable mistake. There are a few shots here of Napoleon's last battle, Waterloo, fought on the 18th of June, 1815, and responsible for ending the French Empire once and for all. Well, until his nephew came along, but that's a story for another time. We do not get many shots in the trailer itself, but a fair few have leaked from behind the scenes, which leads us down another little bit of a rabbit hole. Let me introduce you to the peaceful Oxfordshire village of Blueberry, a quintessential English village with timber-framed houses, a parish church, a charming little farmer's market, and a dodgy white van driving around stealing people's kitchen radiators. This tranquil peace was shattered in May of 2022 when Ridley Scott attacked. With the film crews for the Waterloo scenes, another man also appeared. 
the phantom shitter of old Blueberry Town. It, it's actually a village, but town works better for this joke. One of the residents reported the sighting of the man. I rented my room to a member of the Marengo film set crew this week to find the place trashed and covered with human feces. I cannot get hold of the person I let the room to, but I have no doubt he will be looking for a room in the village for the rest of the stay. I would avoid based on my experiences. I won't share the poop pictures. And with that, he disappeared into the fog of the night. Some say though, that the Phantom's call can be heard on the wind to this very day. One off instance like this aside, filming seems to have gone well, and we got quite a look at how the battle will be portrayed on screen, although, again, like much of this trailer, I have concerns. From what we can see, the French and British armies seem to have dug in, with their tents and baggage, instead of being deployed to the rear so they don't get damaged in the battle, being virtually on the front line. Meanwhile, the whole position is festooned with redoubts, spikes and trenches. The brief glimpse we get here of the French advancing in a thin single line, whilst the defending British soldiers are all spread out and ducking for cover, looks more like something you would see in the First World War, not the Napoleonic Wars, where armies fought in proper formations. The Marengo scenes earlier seem to show the Austrian troops deployed in lines and columns, so why not here? Another point about the battlefield. Blueberry, obviously, does not have a series of farmhouses in the area where filming was done, so, unless they are CGI'd in later, the critical farmhouses of Hougoumont and La Haissante will be absent. We only get a few glimpses of the Allied troops in the trailer, mainly some British infantry ducking for cover, as stated before, and these two groups of infantry in square formation, defending themselves from French cuirassiers, probably depicting Marshal Ney's infamous series of cavalry charges. A quick side note, the French cavalry seem to love carrying random French flags, as opposed to their regimental standards and guidons. Again, I must take this point, as I have done in the past videos. Standards have a purpose. In the French army, each regiment had one eagle, that would be decorated with the regiment's battle honours. It served a practical purpose of showing where the regiment was, so the men could rally to the colours. It's part of the reason why the British foot guards of today still do the traditional trooping of the colour each year on the sovereign's official birthday, so they knew what their standard looked like. The colours also represent the regiment itself, hence why it has all its battle honours. To lose it would be a great dishonour, and to capture the enemies, a great honour. Random flags aren't just carried for fun. It is weird since in some shots from what is probably Austerlitz, some of the French cavalry are carrying the correct standards anyway, so it seems like a load of money was wasted on the cavalrymen carrying a bunch of extra French flags. Anyway, the square looks accurate and it is good to see this formation. The officers, the colour bearers and the drummers are in the middle, protected by the men. Uniform wise, the British ones are pretty much spot on from what I can see, and are accurate for what they would have been wearing at Waterloo. The facings varied from regiment to regiment of course, but these ones look fine, probably being from either the foot guards or one of the royal regiments. What worries me far more though, is actually the lack of other non-British units. At Waterloo, Napoleon had about 72,000 men, pretty much all French, save for a squadron of his famous Polish lancers and a few other small contingents. Wellington, meanwhile, led a force of 68,000 men. Of these, about 25,000 were British troops, a bit over a third of the army. The rest consisted of 6,000 men of the King's German Legion, German troops in British service and wearing British uniforms. 11,000 were from the German Kingdom of Hanover, ruled by King George III and wearing similar uniforms to the British as well. Then there were the 17,000 Dutch Belgian troops, mainly in blue uniforms, 6,000 from the German Duchy of Brunswick in black, and 3,000 from the German Duchy of Nassau in dark green and blue. The Dutch and German troops were heavily engaged that day, with the villages of Papelot and La Haye changing hands several times between the Dutch Nassau troops and the French. They often get forgotten somewhat. Even in the 1970 film at Waterloo, they are reduced to a couple of staff officers and one comment from Marshal Ney. Wellington won't hold us an hour, not with that buoy of ass of his. English, Brunswickers, Belgians and God knows what else. From the rest of the behind the scenes stuff, the only other allied units here, aside from the British troops, are some red-coated British heavy cavalry, unless any other units turn up. For once though, it looks like Sharp and the 95th won't be dominating this at least. Now, I'm sure you're all saying, well, of course they can't depict every unit there, they wouldn't have the time and money. And that is rather my point. The 1970 movie, two hours long, of which about an hour covers the fighting on the day, missed out a lot of stuff. 
So tell me, how is this two and a half hour movie going to cover Toulon, the 13th of Vendemiaire, the Pyramids, Marengo, Austerlitz, the Russian campaign, and Waterloo, and give you an idea of what is going on? I might come back to this point later in the conclusion. It does look like we will be getting the Prussians, though, marching in columns as well. I suspect CGI will fill out these empty bits. Most likely, this will be the arrival of the Prussian army, and I highly suspect this shot will be Napoleon looking out and seeing them arrive, realising that the battle is lost. I cannot really see the Prussian uniforms here, but they look to be a shade of dark blue like the historical ones, and given that the production has been pretty good so far with its uniforms and costumes, I will assume these are accurate. A variety of shots here, the first of which is what appears to be the burning of Moscow during the 1812 campaign, judging from the onion domes on the buildings. A bit later in the trailer, we also get a brief shot of a surprise Napoleon riding into an abandoned Kremlin. This location here is actually Blenheim Palace in Oxfordshire, where some of the first parts of filming were done in February of 2022. Now, the obvious thing to note is that Blenheim Palace doesn't really resemble the Kremlin too much. Although, obviously, the Kremlin of 1812 would have looked dramatically different to the Kremlin of today. This is partly due to a rather silly reason that, uh, well, buckle in, it's a bit of a story. In late March, early April, it was reported that filming would take place at the Catholic Westminster Cathedral in London. While some of the Notre Dame sets were seen, accounts claim that the bulk of the filming there would be for the interior scenes for the Kremlin, due to the cathedral, built in the late Victorian Edwardian eras, having an architectural style similar to the old Byzantine Orthodox look. Sets were built, and all looked well. Until modern politics got in the way, and due to certain YouTube policies, I will henceforth be changing the names of certain people and countries, so I don't get struck down. The Kremlin is currently in Big Country, which is next to Smaller Country. Currently, Dobby lives in the Kremlin in Big Country, and in February of 2022, invaded Small Country, run by Paddington Bear. What has this got to do with the Napoleon movie, set over 200 years before these events? Well, the Catholic Church of England allegedly decided that the idea of turning such a historic religious site into something so closely linked to Dobby was clearly going to be problematic. A decision was made that it just could not happen. Limited filming was allowed without the sets, but apparently this meant that they had to replace the interior scenes with green screen. These decisions, allegedly, cost the production £500,000. It should be noted though, this has all come from the press, and as far as I'm aware, neither the Catholic Church of England nor Apple have put out statements regarding this. If true though, I don't see how giving Ridley Scott a headache is going to stop Dobby. There's also a very brief shot of... I think it is the Duke of Wellington, judging from his various foreign awards, including the military order of Maria Theresa, which seems to be based off this portrait of him. The actor here is Rupert Everett, who is currently 64 years old. He's nearly 20 years older than Wellington was at Waterloo, for God's sake. I love the young people. Why did you make him so old? In the trailer, Wellington says, over a montage of the poem being very lovey-dovey, this vermin has held the world hostage with his egotism and his lack of simple good manners. I will be honest, I was half expecting another officer to start chuckling whilst sipping a cup of tea when hearing that line. Given how much time the film has to cover, I wouldn't be surprised if this and Waterloo will be his only scenes in the movie. On the positive side, there is a nice shot here of Napoleon after a victory in his younger or less old days. Again, I'm assuming Marengo. A very brief shot here of Napoleon standing on a burning carriage in the street. This is depicting the events of the Rue saint Nicaise, or the Machine Infernal plot. On the 24th of December, 1800, Napoleon, a year or so into his rule as first consul, was riding to the opera with Josephine. As they passed by the Rue saint Nicaise, a bomb went off planted by royalists who wanted to assassinate him. The scenes were, again, filmed near the old Royal Naval College, and look pretty accurate. The mounted guards here are correct. This unit of the Garde Consulaire would later go on to become the Chasseurs au Cheval de la Garde, when Napoleon became Emperor, and he often wore their green tunic. Back to 1800 though, as far as I'm aware, the bomb completely missed the carriage, and it wasn't turned over and set on fire, although a number of innocent bystanders were killed and wounded, which is correct. It looks like we might get a scene as well where Napoleon is trying to calm down Josephine by... Uh, strangling her or something. Then some more Josephine scenes. I will be honest, at this point, the emphasis on the love story with Josephine is going to be a bit distracting for me. 
Of course, she is important, but we never really get to see much of what he did as a ruler and a general in movies and TV series. The love story aspect has been heavily emphasised, and I would like to see less of that and more of his achievements. I do think Josephine here saying the poem would be nothing without him is a bit of a stretch, but then she was quite dismissive of him at various times, in spite of his devotion to her. Briefly, there is also a scene, I think from the Hundred Days, when the Poland is planning for the Waterloo campaign. It is weird since some of the generals at the back are in the Republic era uniforms, which wouldn't have been worn for well over a decade at this point. Obviously, we have the French flag and the British flag, and then what are meant to be the flags of Prussia and Austria. The Prussian flag seems to be missing the crown, the sword and the scepter, although it is a reasonable approximation. The Austrian one, depicted here though, is the red-white-red one. At the time, the Austrian Empire used the black and yellow flag, the colours of the Habsburg dynasty. I will let it pass though, since the Archduchy of Austria has used this flag from the Middle Ages onwards, and it was also used, as we saw earlier, in some military honours and so forth. Also, I'm just getting very tired and I want to be done with this. These scenes here are meant to depict the Battle of Austerlitz, one of Napoleon's most famous victories, and, sadly, the portrayal of it so far looks a bit inaccurate. These scenes were most likely filmed at Bourne Wood, Surrey, in March-April. They were also filmed alongside some scenes probably from the Russian campaign, which haven't shown up in the trailer. Seeing these pictures, though, of what is probably Austerlitz, I couldn't initially figure out what battle it was. I assumed something like Eilau, which was fought in heavy snow and was a rather bloody affair. However, sometime before the trailer, a screening was held for a select audience, and in their reviews, coupled with the shots in the trailer, we get a pretty good picture of what will happen. Napoleon stands on the wooded hill with his old guard, overlooking a small-ish French camp, again on the front line, and is told that we are discovered, and then simply replies, good. Then there are shots of Russian and Austrian soldiers flailing around on the ice before Count Akbarsky of the Russian army yells out, it's a trap, as Napoleon unveils that he was hiding his artillery all along, and then blows up the lake, presumably drowning a good chunk of the Allied army. This is a pretty big deviation from the history, although it is based off one incident that occurred towards the end of the battle. In reality, to sum it up as briefly as I can, in late 1805, the Poland smashed the Austrians at Ulm, and had marched well into Austrian territory, but was now finally fought into a battle with the combined Austrian and Russian armies, also led by their respective emperors. The Poland had about 65 to 75,000 men, and was facing somewhere between 85 and 95,000. Not only that, his forces weren't yet concentrated, with de Vaux's third corps still near Vienna. He began to give the impression to the Allies that he was weak, receiving some of the Tsar's officers and showing himself to be worried. He also deliberately exposed his right flank, tempting his enemies, and on the 2nd of December, they took the bait. Their attack was halted though once de Vaux's corps marched into support. Now was Napoleon's chance. Under dense fog, he ordered his men to attack the Prats and Heights in the centre, now weakened due to the attack on Napoleon's right. Fighting was heavy, but this blow eventually separated the Allied armies and won the day for the French. It was at this moment some of the Russian troops fled across the frozen ponds, and, so the story goes, many were drowned as the French artillery fired on the ice. However, the story was most likely exaggerated, since after the battle, only a handful of bodies were ever found, even after draining the ponds nowhere near the thousands claimed in other accounts. It should be noted, even if the break the ice part is true, and a large number of Russians died, this was not some master plan by Napoleon. Here, they seem to be implying he's putting a small force in front, tricking them onto a lake, and then destroying them, which is not what happened at all. His actual plan was far more devious and wide-reaching than simply doing something like this. You could show the actual manoeuvres here, and not boil it down to some sort of semi-fictitious scene, but again, as I pointed out earlier, they simply want to cram everything into a rather short amount of time. Overall, I have mixed feelings. On the one hand, Ridley Scott and his team have clearly done some research, and it looks like they'll get the look of the period down pretty well. Many of these uniforms look quite fantastic. On the other hand, I've already been jaded by productions in the past going for an authentic look, but then actually ruining the history when it got released, looking at you becoming Elizabeth. And given some of these comments from the screenings, and some other odd choices from the trailer, I'm taking a more worried approach this time. Also, whilst it will be about two and a half hours long, I am concerned about the pacing. This is one of the most dramatic periods in human history, and will focus on a legendary figure who I do not think can be summed up in that time without making the story go at breakneck speed. 
If this were just up to him seizing power in 1799, or at a push, his coronation as emperor in 1804, then I think it could be done. But then covering the entirety of the Napoleonic Wars, right up to Waterloo, feels like a bridge too far. Or a Moscow too far, if I want to do a more accurate pun. I am aware that Ridley Scott has said there is a four and a half hour cut, which may make things better, but my gut feeling is telling me that it will make things worse. In this article, for example, we are told that the extended edition will have way more Josephine. Considering that we've already slimmed down his military career, you know, the thing that made him a legend in the first place, I think it would have been better to look a bit more at that, don't you? What is also concerning from interviews is the way Napoleon's character will be handled. In the same article, Vanessa Kirby says the following, Napoleon wasn't stoic and wonderful like Russell Crowe was in Gladiator. He was a dictator, a war criminal really. It couldn't be rousing, because that man killed hundreds and hundreds of thousands of men, in my opinion, needlessly. And for what? To get an empire? For what? In the end, it all disintegrated anyway. That psyche run wild is dangerous as hell, and very strange. And this is a portrait of that. These comments pretty much echo what Ridley Scott himself has said, and I find this all rather concerning. Now, yes, you can point to what happened after the fall of Toulon, and most infamously the massacre of Ottoman prisoners at Jaffa, but to use the term war criminal feels like a very modern term to apply to the events of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And then to dismiss his empire as being needless because it collapsed anyway is really odd. I mean, the Roman, the Mongol, and the British empires all collapsed in the end anyway. Were they pointless by this logic? Like him or loathe him, he did establish numerous institutions that exist to this day, and caused a major legacy upon history. Dismissing him as a war criminal and a dictator is not a very nuanced way to approach his legacy. The casting as well does not sit right with me, as I've explained already, with the poem feeling way too quiet and subdued, and Josephine being far too young, but then, who knows, maybe I will eat my words when this film is released. However, this comment from Scott also makes me a bit worried. He'll come in, and you're effing two weeks out, and he'll say, I don't know what to do, Scott said about Phoenix. I'll say, what? I don't know what to do. I don't know. I really don't know. Oh god, I said, come in, sit down. We sat for ten days, all day, talking scene by scene. In a sense, we rehearsed absolutely detail by detail. In other articles, it has also been stated that Scott rewrote a lot of the script to fit Phoenix, which, again, given the comments about the war criminal stuff, give me a gut feeling of concern. But again, as I said, maybe I'll eat my words when it comes out. You can expect a quick review, or quick by my standards, sometime after it is out. In the meantime, this has been The Laughing Cavalier, wishing you a good day. Shall we start with the piles? It might make sense to start with the piles. A good a window as any into how Ridley Scott has approached his latest, possibly oddest and definitely most idiosyncratic historical epic. Napoleon was a horseman. He suffered from piles, he tells us. Throw in quite the curve ball when we ask about the film's battle sequences. That's varicose veins up your butt, right? I don't have them, but they're very, very painful. It ain't funny. It's like having a toothache up your butt. There's nothing you can do. We sense history might have been different had Napoleon not had a very bad attack of piles on the day of Waterloo. You heard this one. We had not. Okay. So I had him at Waterloo. He says of one of history's most famous battles. Sitting on the loo, and it's pouring with rain outside. And he does his business. He gets up. Looks in the loo. There is blood. Then he does the day in battle. Sweating and in agony with the piles, David Scarpa, the screenwriter, said, Isn't this rather indignified? I said, maybe, but it's accurate. But we took it out of the movie because it became the distracting. <laughs>